Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, fiends. <laughs> I mean, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is Raymond, your host, inviting you through the squeaking door. Don't hesitate. Come right in. Oh, it's a bit dark. Careful, don't brush up against that skeleton. Oh, he's quite harmless, I assure you. He's only the skeleton in our closet come out for a bit of air. <laughs> the idea of a skeleton coming out for air. Such nonsense. Oh, you mean because it's already so well ventilated? <laughs> oh, how do you do, Mary Bennett? Hello, Mr. Raymond. Mm. Now, you tell me truthfully. Is there a family skeleton in your closet? Oh, yes, indeed. And what's more, we make no bones about it. <laughs> But I'd uh, like to really get him out of the closet. I need space to store my Lipton's noodle soup. What a silly thing to say. Hmm? You know very well that Lipton's noodle soup comes in a tidy little package that takes up hardly any room at all. Oh. Fact is, Lipton's is convenient all the way around. It takes hardly any time to make, costs less, and makes lots more than canned soups. And when it comes to flavor, nothing can beat Lipton's. It's a grand... Homemade tasting noodle soup with a, a chickeny flavor. And folks, Lipton's is just swimming with tender golden egg noodles. It's like I always say, you just don't know how good noodle soup can be till you've tried Lipton's. And like I always say, tonight put a tight hat on your head so your hair won't rise and get ready to listen to No Coffin for the Dead. It's an original story by Emil Tepperman. And our star tonight is that famous radio actor, Les Tremaine, who plays the part of Tom Archer. Along the swanky East River Drive, all is quiet, except for the footsteps of two men who hurry toward one of the many tall apartment houses. Let me introduce you quickly to these two men before uh, death strikes out at them. The man on the outside, the tall, blonde man, is District Attorney Tom Archer. The other one, the lean, dark-haired fellow, is Tom Archer's assistant, John Frayne. Tom's really worried about some... I'll walk you to the door of your house, John. I, I don't like your being out alone this late at night. Whoever's been sending you those threatening letters isn't... Jo Look out, John! That fellow in the alley with a knife! Look out! Oh, Drop that oh, knife, you! Oh, oh. oh, you... You've killed him. You've killed John Frayne. No! Keep back, you... No! How was that knife? You don't... No! No! Don't, don't stab me! No! Oh, the... The devil... Killed John Frayne. Stabbed me. I'll remember his face if I... I ever see him again. I'll remember... When I began to regain consciousness after that attack, I, I was lying on the ground at the mouth of the little alley near John Frame's home. A fussy little ambulance intern had just finished working over me. There was a small crowd around me. And I glimpsed the face of Detective Inspector Lambert just behind the intern. There. Feel better now, Mr. Archer? Uh, how is he, Doc? I about got him fixed up, Inspector Lambert. I think he'll be all right. He's conscious now. Can I talk to him? Yeah, but better not move him for a few minutes till the shock wears off. How are you, Mr. Archer? Well, pretty good. I feel like a mummy with all these bandages. Yeah, both hands. What do they do? Jumpy with knives? Oh, we... We were passing the alley. John and I... John! What happened to John Frame? Speak up, Inspector. What happened to John? Now, take it easy, Mr. Archer. John's dead. They got him in the back. Right through the heart. Oh, merciful heaven. John! 
get a look at the killers, Mr. Archer. Could you identify them? Well, but there, there was only one man. He, he, he came out of the alley. He stabbed John, and then he swung at me. I, I didn't have time to go for my gun, so I, I caught the blade in my bare hands. And he ripped the knife away and stabbed at me. I, I don't know how many times. Six stab wounds, Mr. Archer. You're darn lucky none of them hit a vital spot. Yeah. That was a brave thing, grabbing the knife with your bare hands. Probably saved your life. That's the mistake the killer made, leaving me alive. I've seen his face. I'll catch up with him. If it takes the rest of my life. I was a, a bit shaky on my feet when Inspector Lambert and the intern helped me up. But I insisted on going over to where the body of John Frayne lay covered with a white sheet. And then I saw Susan leaning against the great comforting bulk of old Mrs. Hogan, her housekeeper. She was looking down at the shroud that covered her husband's body. It was God's will, Mrs. Frayne. Susan. Oh, Tom. Tom, I can't believe it. The child... Be, be brave, Susan. John's dead. Nothing I can say will replace him. Have you any idea who the murderer is? Oh, I, I saw his face for a moment, that's all. But I'll recognize it again, I'm sure. Mr. Archer, here's something we found in the alley. What is it, Inspector? Looks like the charm off a watch fob. It's broken off. A charm? Well, you recognize it, Mrs. Brain? Oh, no. No, it can't be. It can't be. No, no, of course not, Susan. There are hundreds of watch charms like this one. What is it, Mrs. Breen? That, that watch charm. It, my younger brother, Peter, wears one just like it. Oh? Oh, nonsense, Lambert. You can buy those in any jewelry store. Besides, I saw the killer's face. It wasn't Pete. Mrs. Hogan. Yes, Mr. Archer? Please take Mrs. Frayne upstairs now. That I'll do. Come along, darling. I'll see you later, Susan. Oh, please stay here, Tom. You're hurt. All those wounds. I'll be okay. Right now, I'm going to go downtown with Inspector Lambert and look at pictures while that murderer's face is fresh in my mind. At headquarters, I looked through hundreds of pictures in the rogues' gallery. It was just two hours before I came upon the photograph. <laughs> Lambert, this is our man. You're sure? I'm positive. I'll never forget that face. Turn it over. Let's see the name quick. Right. Art Hogan. Good heavens. Art Hogan. That would be the son of old Mrs. Hogan. The frame housekeeper. <laughs> Lambert and I both remembered the case of Bart Hogan. It went back five years before John Flane had married Susan. Bart Hogan had lived with his mother, both working for Susan's father. One day, Bart Hogan had snatched up a kitchen knife and attacked Susan's father with mad fury. Only John's lucky arrival had saved the old man. John subdued Bart Hogan. The mad youngster had been committed to the state asylum for life. But he had escaped seven months ago. Nobody had heard from him since then. Until tonight. Great Scott. So that murderous kid has come back after all these years. To get his revenge. I'm going back to the frame house. I, I want to talk to Mrs. Hogan. You think she might know where our son can be found? Who knows? I'll talk to her anyway. Uh, by the way, Mr. Archer. Yes? While you're up there, suppose you just kind of check on whether Brother Pete has lost his watch charm. <laughs> Frayne's occupied a top-floor duplex in the riverfront apartment house. I took the elevator up, and Mrs. Hogan admitted me. I'll take your hat and coat, Mr. Archer. Thank you. Mrs. Hogan, where's your son, Bart? Bart? Well, why'd you ask after Bart? Have you seen or heard from him since he escaped from the state asylum? What... What makes you ask that? Mrs. Hogan, 
that there's reason to believe that the person who attacked us in the alley is your son, Bart. Oh, no, no. Never say that, Mr. Archer. I'm afraid it's true. No, it, it, it couldn't be. I swear to you, it couldn't be, Bart. Why not? I, I can't tell you why. But it wasn't Bart, I'm sure. What makes you so sure? You know where he's been hiding since his escape? You know where he is now? Oh, heaven help me. If you know where he is, you must give him up. <laughs> but he didn't do it. He didn't. Believe me, Mrs. Hogan. I understand how you feel. But it'd be far better for Bart to go back to the state asylum than to be hunted for this new crime. If he didn't do it. Uh, Mr. Archer, if, if I prove to you that Bart couldn't have done it, would you let him be? Not make him go back to the asylum? Well, I, I don't know what to say. You see, I was downtown just now, and I recognized the picture of the man who attacked us. It turned out to be your son. There's very little chance that I was mistaken. But if I prove he couldn't have done it... How can you prove it? Well, come. I'll show you. <laughs> usually ruddy face was drained of blood as she led me up the stairs to the upper floor of the duplex and then along the hall to her room. I always keep the door locked. Go inside, please. Oh, I, I don't see anything in this room, Mrs. Hogan. Well, over here, please, at the closet. Hmm. Is that you, Ma? Is that you? It's all right, Bart, darling. I... I brought a good friend. Good heavens. You've been hiding him here in this closet? For seven months now. When he escaped from the asylum, he came here. I cleared out the closet. It just holds the cot. He lies in there night and day. Where's he, Ma? Where'd you bring him? What's he want? Now, don't be afraid, Bart. Mr. Archer won't hurt you. He wants to ask you some questions. Bart... Have you been out of this room tonight? <laughs> out? Me? Not a chance. He tells the truth, Mr. Archer. Here. I'll pull the blanket back and show you the proof. There. Look at his legs. He was shot in both legs when he escaped from the asylum. I couldn't get medical attention for him and the wounds never healed properly. I see... You must believe me now, Mr. Archer. Bart couldn't be one who attacked you. Because, well, he'll never be able to walk as long as he lives. Mm. <laughs> well, now, if Bart Hogan didn't do it, and mind you, I said if. Then who did kill poor John Frayne? Well, whoever killed him must have been a rather cheerful person because he uh, took life so cheerfully. <laughs> cheerful indeed. Mr. Raymond, you've always had such gruesome thoughts on your mind, you wouldn't recognize something cheerful if you met right up with it. Oh, now, Mary, aren't you being a bit unfair? No, I'm not. You just don't know what folks like. But you listen to me, because I'm going to make a suggestion that'll please everyone. All right. Folks, if you want to give the boys overseas a real taste of home, why not send them a package or two of Lipton's Noodle Soup? It's so easy to do. You don't even need a request slip. You know, a bowl of hot soup makes a mighty good snack for the boys. And when they receive Lipton's Noodle Soup mix, they're getting that old-fashioned kind of chickeny-tasting noodle soup. So send a package or two of Lipton's to your favorite service man. That's a terrific suggestion. And uh, here's another thing that pleases me. There seems to be plenty of murder ahead in tonight's story. Uh, you remember that pretty little girl, Susan? Well, looks like she's next on the murderer's list. How about that, Tom? Come on. Tell us more. And don't spare the gold. When I entered the living room on the lower floor, a few minutes later, Susan and Peter were there with Arnold Matson, the lawyer. Hey, 
tell you this is a serious problem, Susan, and we've got to find an answer to it. But there is no answer, Mr. Metz. No. Oh. oh, oh, Tom, thank heaven you've come at last. Hello, Susan. Hello, Peter. Hi. You know Mr. Madsen, of course. Well, of yeah. course. Uh, I understand, Mr. Archer, that you narrowly escaped the same fate as poor John. Well, uh, I was lucky. Those bandages must be a nuisance. I can stand them. Bandages are better than a shroud. Uh, by the way, Peter, that uh, looks like a new watch charm you're wearing. What, this? Oh, I lost the other one someplace, so I bought a new one. What of it? Oh, Nothing. Uh, Mr. Matson, when I came in, you were saying something about a, a serious problem. Oh, exactly. As you know, Susan's father left an estate of a million and a quarter dollars in a trust fund to be paid to Susan on her 23rd birthday. Yes, yes, I know. And she'll be 23 next month. But uh, there's a proviso in the will, Mr. Archer. In order to receive the inheritance, Susan must be married and living with her husband on that date. Please, Mr. Matson, I... I don't want to talk about the money. Yes, but don't you see? You lose it all. Will distinctly says that you must be living with your husband. If not, then the money goes to eight charities, except for $50,000 to Peter. I don't care. I don't care what happens to the money. Without John, it doesn't matter. Well, well, Peter, it'll be a break for you. What do you mean by that, Master? Well, there's no need to become enraged, Peter. I only pointed out... Oh, you out. filthy rat, I'll show you what I'm going to do. Go, 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 You'd like to marry Susan yourself, wouldn't you? Why, you rotten little... You better cool off a little, Tom. This is no time for a scene. No, I'm sorry. Yes, Peter, you're right. I would like to marry Susan. You know that, don't you? Yes, Tom, I know. Duh. You two look at each other like a couple of puppies in love. I'm going to get a good drink. And nuts to the 50,000. Right, George, I've got it. Got what, Mr. Matson? The solution. The solution to our problem. What are you talking about? Well, that's it, don't you see, Susan? You can marry Tom Archer here, and then you'll be able to legally claim the estate on your birthday. Well, that's a pretty callous thing to suggest, Matson. Callous? I'm a lawyer. It's my duty to protect my client. I... I couldn't do it. Of course not. Look here, Susan. Is there anyone else in the world who would benefit by John's death? I, I don't know. I, I, I can't think. Well, what's the difference? Are you still looking for clues, Archer? You know who the murderer is, young Bart Hogan. Why look further? Bart Hogan? Metzen. How did you know about Bart Hogan? What? What do you mean? Well, I, I just come from Inspector Lambert's office. There, there was nobody present when we found Hogan's picture. How did you know about it? Well, it's really quite simple. I phoned headquarters a little while ago, and Inspector Lambert told me. Archer, uh, Matson! Uh, what's that? Peter! Archer, come quick, in the kitchen! Well, come along, Matson, quick. Yes. You stay here, Susan. All right, Pete, take it easy. We're coming. Down the hall, in the kitchen. Get hold of yourself. You, you open the door. I, I can't. Look, go ahead, Archer, open it. <gasps> Good heavens. It's... Mrs. Hogan. She lay on the kitchen floor on her back, with blood all over her clothes. The blood came from a gaping knife wound in her throat, and the knife lay on the floor alongside her. I found her that way. Her, uh, body's warm. She was killed within the last ten or fifteen minutes. Then, then the killer's running loose somewhere in the house. Susan, she's alone. <laughs> Good heavens, there on the floor. Susan, Susan, darling. Is she, is she dead? Oh, no, no, she's, she's only fainted, the shock. Oh. oh. It's all right, Susan. Uh, what happened? Uh, was it, was it Mrs. Hawkins? Yes. Who? We don't know. But the killer's in the house. That madman is liable to kill us all, one at a time. I have a revolver. Let's search the house. Right. Matson, you go in the kitchen and stand guard over that knife. There may be fingerprints on Very it. Very well. Peter, you stay here with Susan. Here's my gun. Don't be afraid to use now, it. Wait. Wait just a minute. What is it, Matson? Has it occurred to you the killer may be 
One of us. One of us? What are you looking at me for? You were out of this room for quite a while. Why, you are a king! Look out again! I I the gun, gun, Peter! Gun. Drop it! That's better. I'll take the gun. He was going to shoot me. Sorry. I lost my head. Oh. Susan, I'm sorry you have to go through all this. Everybody's on edge. There's a killer loose in the house, and we've got to find him. Yes, Tom. I know you'll do whatever's right. I'll try. Uh, you two. You can both stay here with Susan. I'll search the house myself. Manson, call the police. Yes, but how can you hold the gun with your hands all bandaged? You, you can't pull the trigger. I'll use it as a club. All right, now. Don't move out of this room till I return. Be careful, Tom. You mustn't let anything happen to you, too. I went slowly up the stairs to the upper floor, gripping the gun by the barrel in my bandaged hand. At the end of the hall, I stopped before the door of Mrs. Hogan's room. I opened the door with the keys. Inside the room, the closet door was open. Bart Hogan was still lying on his cot. He must have been expecting me. His eyes were wild with terror. He had a long pencil clutched in his right hand, the only weapon he could find to use against me. His left fist was clutched into a tight ball. He watched me, stiff with fear, as I moved slowly toward him, across the room. Keep away from me. I had no time to waste on him. I swept aside the fist that clutched the pencil Help. and brought the revolver butt down hard on his forehead. Help. I... I went over to the window, opened it. Then I... I went back to the bed and pulled the sheet, pulled it away lifted him. His weak and withered legs dangled uselessly. I carried him over to the window, rested him against the sill. He opened his eyes. He was recovering from the blow. I didn't wait. I pushed hard. He went toppling out of the window. I leaned over and saw the body strike against the tenth floor setback, then go hurtling into the air and smashed down upon the pavement far below. There wasn't enough of him left to perform an autopsy on. They'd never know his legs had been no good, that he hadn't been able to walk. Everything would be easy sailing from here on. Susan would marry me to save the estate. A million and a quarter dollars. Oh, I'd been clever enough. When I called out that fake warning at the mouth of the alley, I myself stabbed John in the back. Then I slashed myself up. They had taken my story at face value, Lambert and the others. I'd guessed that Mrs. Hogan was hiding Bart, but just as a precaution, I'd stolen Peter's watch chain and dropped it at the scene of the crime in case I should need another suspect. But when I found Bart couldn't walk, it became necessary to kill Mrs. Hogan, too she was the only one who could tell the police that Bart hadn't been able to walk. All I had to do now was go down and say I'd found Bart, we had fought, and he had fallen from the window. The perfect crime. I took one more last look down into the street where a crowd had gathered around Bart's body. I was able to make out the figure of Inspector Lambert bending over what was left of him. And I saw Lambert force something out of the clenched left fist of the dead body. In a flash, I remembered that feeble little pencil with which Bart had tried to defend himself. I pulled in my head from the window and glanced across to the closet. I saw it at once. A small white scratch pad. I rushed across the room and snatched up the pad. There, on the topmost page, were the indentations of what Bart Hogan had written on the page and then had torn off. I could read it clearly. I could almost imagine his terrified voicing of the frightened appeal as he wrote it. Archer was here. He means to kill me. 
He wants them to think I killed John Frame. But I can't walk. I've got two bullets in my legs. For God's sake, save me. Bart had written that note, meaning to throw it out the window. But I had come back too soon for him. And I had thrown it out of the window for him. I went back to the window and looked down. I saw Lambert peering up. Then he turned away and hurried toward the entrance of the building. He's coming for me. There's only one thing for me to do now. I've locked the door. It'll take time to break it down. In the meantime, I've taken the bandage off my right hand. I'm writing a full account of tonight's work. I gambled for a fortune. And I lost. Yes, sir, he seemed like such a nice young man. Well, his trouble was he tried to commit the perfect crime without first practicing up on minor crimes. He should have started by stealing watermelons and then maybe tried his hand at robbing mail trains. Mr. Raymond, what are you suggesting? And just when I was getting ready to tell people to send a bowl of soup to the boys overseas. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't the soup get cold by the time it arrived? Oh, of course not. Why, Lipton's noodle soup mix comes in a flat package. Mm. You simply send it along to your favorite soldier. And he'll be pleased by your little gift because this noodle soup is just like a, well, just like a taste of home. So enclose a package or two of Lipton's the next time you write to him. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry you have to go so soon. But drop in again next Tuesday for another little blood fest. You know, some people have to commit murders to get a kick out of life. Others get their satisfaction from listening to Inner Sanctum. But a word of advice. If you've got to commit a murder, please don't get yourself caught. Because if you do, you'll surely get a free ride with the only person never bothered by backseat drivers. I mean that they're curse drivers. <laughs> by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is A Time to Die by Hilda Lawrence. Now, I guess it's time to close that there squeaking door until next week when Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup bring you another Inner Sanctum Mystery directed by Hyman Brown. So until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, here we are outside the squeaking door. And I guess we're all pretty shaken up after hearing about those murders. But I know just the thing that'll put us back to normal again. It's Lipton tea. Yes, a cup of that brisk Lipton tea would do just fine. And did you notice that word brisk? B-R-I-S-K. It's a mighty important...